So good afternoon. And today we are going to try to answer certain questions that are being posed to me over and over again, like what is the readiness of our software ecosystem? Where is it heading next year? And when can we finally just drop software onto a RISC-V board and get going? So my name is Philip Tomsich. Um, I'm working with a software consultancy that is working on a lot of compiler stuff and similar, but today I'm speaking here as the chair of the Software Horizontal Committee, and I will try to answer all of these questions. So 2021 has really seen us achieve great things. Uh, software was involved in it just as every other group when we standardized the new extensions, and the goal with that is not just to have extensions, but to address new application areas, to get our performance up, and to simply find more adopters for RISC-V, more applications. So we have added virtualization support, which has huge impacts on software. Uh, with that, we can address cloud data center workloads. Uh, but on the other hand, we need to have the corresponding software components ready and running. We have added cryptographic extensions with CryptoScalar, which is one of the parts that we need to have good crypto solutions or crypto performance out there, but that needs us adapting the libraries out there. So every time we're adding a new piece of hardware solution or a new solution that addresses a specific key market, software needs to follow hardware. Uh, the same goes with Bitmanip. Uh, we have the bit manipulation extensions out there. It's giving us uh, very nice improvements in code size, uh, very nice speed ups on major workloads ranging from embedded up to the data center. Um, 10, 15 percent improvements in terms of instruction size on spec. Yet again, we have the instructions there. Now the compilers need to follow. Certain libraries need to be hand optimized if they've chosen to have um, their own inline assembly. And finally, we've added cache management operations, page-based memory types. Uh, all of that is serving us in order to reduce the amount of fragmentation that we might have between different implementations to make software development easier. But at the same time, software needs to adopt it. Software needs to follow. So when I'm asked, where are we heading? What is up next for us? What will 2022 bring, 2023 for RISC-V? My answer is more software, better software, a concentrated effort on software. So we as a RISC-V community need to foster adoption starting now, going on in 2022, and even further on, in order to really drive a great leap forward for the software ecosystem. And that is going to help us to bring more users to RISC-V, more applications to RISC-V. So when we're looking at the RISC-V software ecosystem, again, software, the software HC is governing this. We're driving things like platforms and profiles. But really, what we stand for is everything. It starts with emulators, uh, like QEMO. It goes on with, with the simulation environments. We're having compilers. Both GCC and LLVM is, is something that software drives through the toolchains and runtimes uh, co committee. We're trying to coordinate with these communities. Uh, performance analysis tools are high on our wish list. Um, we interact with some other communities there as well. We're trying to address the performance of the libraries that are out for RISC-V today. I already mentioned OpenSSL. There is a major effort going on around enabling crypto. All of the numeric computational libraries up for grabs, so the HPC community knows just too well how, how that is playing out. And finally, managed runtimes. Modern software is not just compiled C code. We have a number of just-in-time compilers, a number of virtual machines that need to run. Uh, it's starting with Python, which is easy, but getting Java right took the ARM ecosystem five, five plus years in order to have it competitive for the data center. Um, we're having new developments like Rust um, and other languages that need to be addressed. And finally, we need the operating systems. So all of that is in our governance. And RISC-V made great, 
great progress on some of the areas early on. So we're having all these stakeholders that need software. Um, just as we heard before, validation needs software. They will also need compilers in order to compile their workloads. Pre-silicon ver validation requires software. Uh, and just, as my, just the same, certain research projects have been focusing on software and trying to get their features implemented in operating systems, doing some research work on security, on the isolation of workloads. But all of that is just a piece of the puzzle. In the end, what we need is the entire thing because users are not interested in one performance library, in one compiler, just Fortran, for example. No, users simply want to lift the software they developed over 10, 20 years over onto RISC-V. This affects everyone. This affects automotive customers. This affects data center customers. All of them just want to have things working. So what we really need is not just those singular solutions, but what we need is ecosystem maturity. And in order to get the ecosystem maturity, what we really need is adoption. Because yes, we as a RISC-V membership are priming the pump today, but we cannot do all the work of, of by ourselves. We need to foster the communities. We need to foster the adoption. Every time we bring a new application to RISC-V, we will find people that are willing and out of their self-interest are going to help us drive our ecosystem forward. It's for mutual benefit, it's open collaboration. But in order for them to start, we need to advance the ecosystem to that point where they can just get their software started. So at this point, we have a strategy or tasks that can be summarized under three simple points. We need to foster adoption and innovation. This is what we're trying to do today as the software agency. We're trying to bring people in. We're trying to discuss issues in security, bring security researchers on. We're looking at performance, interacting with, with the HPC community, trying to identify new areas where RISC-V can bring a real benefit directly to the users and that way bring more software developers onto our platform. At the same time, we have been moving fast. We've been moving incredibly fast with those 15, 16 new extensions and we're trying to manage fragmentation. Uh, for example, there's been adopters of draft specifications of vector and now we have the real vector specification but we cannot just cut them off. So one of the areas is how do we bring these things in? How do we fold them in so we don't scare anybody away from our ecosystem uh, while actually guiding people along in order to use the standard specification? And then finally, once we have solved those two puzzle pieces, we will deliver optimized software. And that only works by having brought people onto it because we, again, we cannot address everything ourselves as a RISC-V membership uh, because there are too many specialized software domains out there. So in order to achieve these three overarching goals, bringing more adopters to us, bringing more innovators to RISC-V, managing fragmentation, and also delivering software, we are working on three pillars today. So the first one is, domain-specific extension work. So in the past, it was very apparent what was missing. So you could just address the shortcomings or the gaps that RISC-V didn't have compared to some of the competing architectures. But today, more and more of that innovation is going to be driven out of software. Graphics, they need matrix multiplication. AI and NL, they know best what workloads they need. In every group we bring in, every interested party that we can bring in to actually innovate on RISC-V is going to bring their own application workloads, their own software workloads. And this is how we attract talent, how we attract software talent, by giving them an opportunity to actually have their application, their domain know-how flow back into ISA extensions. At the same time, we're trying to address the fragmentation issue with a second pillar of what we're doing. And that second pillar is standardization platform standardization, profiles, the two topics that you will be hearing a lot over the next two days. And 
there lies the key to actually scaling up. Once we have standard platforms, once we have standard profiles, we can attract more people with custom off-the-shelf software to custom off-the-shelf hardware platforms. And finally, and that is the real key component, because I've been saying it over and over again, we need to attract people. We can, just we can only foster it. We can move things into the right direction. We prime the pump. But what we really need to develop is a contributor culture. So we're, we're under the Linux Foundation umbrella in a way anyway. They exactly know how to do that. And this is a similar model that we need to develop. We need to focus on getting people to contribute back on the software, not just be RISC-V users, but them becoming RISC-V contributors and helping us to drive forward the upstream projects, to help us on the Linux side, to help us on the library side, to help us with their specific applications. And we're on the way towards it. We're working hard to actually bring semiconductor companies in that have done their own thing and may not have contributed it back yet. But it is a focus area and it works together with the other two pillars in order to move our software ecosystem forward. So where are our ecosystem priorities today? It's really only two. On the one hand, we need to get operating system support on. We've been, great, we've been doing great in Embedded. So if you go downstairs, you see a number of very exciting applications with RISC-V, but most of them are in an embedded space today. What we need is operating system support. And the key to breaking out of this embedded niche that we're in is to attract the Red Hats, the Canonicals, the, uh, and similar companies to actually see us as a first-class platform. And again, this is where the platform standardization is kicking in, because that allows them to target one standardized platform instead of having to target many dissimilar boards. Actually, we're trying to learn from the mistakes that others have made before us and build on that in order to have a much easier way of, of adopting RISC-V and trying it out. Because What's easier for a hobbyist than ordering a board, downloading the software, putting them together, and just having it work? And the second part of that, once they have the operating system working, is we need the best in class tool support. So I'm a tools person myself. I was talking about compilers before. I mentioned that I've been working on them. But a software developer wants to move their application forward. They don't want to fight tools. They want to use tools in order to innovate. So to attract the best developers, we need the tools adopting RISC-V. We need to have the performance tools and similar. Most of those are open source projects. So they will work with us if we provide the information and if we engage them. And a lot of this is actually um, funded research work that will come to our platform if we have something interesting to offer. And performance monitoring and similar are trying to go into that direction. Now you might ask yourself if I've gone mad and completely forgotten about Embedded, but we aren't forgetting about Embedded. So Embedded has brought us here. So even as we're standardizing platforms and even as we're focusing on the operating systems first, we are also working on standardizing our platforms to the point where people can more easily port software from one chip to another uh, in that way, have a, higher, uh, have a higher motivation, a stronger motivation in terms of return on investment, in terms of investment protection to join our ecosystem. So before I conclude, I have a lot of exciting news for you. So just an outlook of what all of this means. So yes, profiles, focus. But the software HC has grown a lot this year. We have a significant number of new groups operating in it, and we're trying to address many of the challenges at once. So actually, one could say we're in catch-up mode still. But the good thing is there's excitement around unified discovery. How do we 
identify the availability of extensions. We're working on that. There's a group there. They're making great progress. Auto vectorization is a topic. I was just discussing before that meeting uh, with, with some people from the HPC background because we need to get it going in LLVM and GCC and our tool chain groups are working hard on, on reaching out to everybody and getting that going. Optimized compilation, secure boot, hypervisors. The graphics and artificial intelligence group that are driving our ISA extensions now and are working on a proposal for matrix multiplication. Uh, we're hosting an IOMMU group in order to get virtualization rounded up after we have the, the um, interrupt controllers ready and the instructions. The platform specifications are in a draft now. And finally, we're having groups working on Android and managed runtime, so Java and V8. And all of that is trying to build our software ecosystem. And all of that is trying to bring developers in so that when you download an operating system next year and the year after, your experience will be much smoother than it is today. Thank you.